Hello, and welcome to today's Pharma Manufacturing Webinar, Enabling a Step Change in Pharma Productivity, sponsored by our friends Aspen Tech and Emerson. First off, my name is Keith Larson. I'm the group publisher responsible for pharma manufacturing within the Endeavor Business Media family. Before we get down to business, let me explain a bit how you can get the most out of today's presentation. First, if you have any technical difficulties, please uh, send a note via the Ask a Question window and our technical experts will help you, uh, help you out. And for best results, we recommend disabling any pop-up blocking software or extensions in your browser as these can cause issues with, with the webinar. We will also be entertaining your questions when we get to the end of the formal part of our presentation. So um, we ask you to submit those through the Ask a Question button at any time during the presentation. And we'll follow up a little bit later um, and, uh, with that. And also please be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Pharma Manufacturing website within about 24 hours. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. And we really encourage you to share the, the archive with um, colleagues who, who you think would benefit from the information. Now, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's discussion. First up is Raman Bhatnagar, VP and General Manager of Aspen Tech Pharma Business Unit. As a seasoned professional with more than 20 years of experience, Raman has a proven track record of leading business critical transformation. Raman is a change manager with a strong technology and operational excellence background, and he most recently served as CEO of Camel Analytics, a market leader in compliant analytics suites for PAT in GMP environments. Aspen Tech acquired Camo Analytics back in 2020. Also joining us today is Crystal Beeler, VP of Life Sciences for Emerson's Process Solutions and Software Business, where she leads day-to-day -day activities in sales, operations, and technology that serve the life sciences industries. Previously, she served as Automation Solutions VP of Sales for the Western United States, where she led teams that helped customers identify, architect, and implement automation and digital strategies across a broad range of industries. Started her career with Emerson in 88 after working as an automation engineer for Sor Sorex Medical. She also holds a bachelor degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Utah. Welcome and thank you both for, for joining me today. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Good morning. All right, now down to, uh, down to brass tacks and really the reason why we're here today. Um, I think we can all agree that the past several years have really been pretty action-packed ones for life sciences companies given the pandemic, and especially if you were on the leading edge of vaccine development and production. No question that digital technology played a critical role in speeding the development of COVID-19 vaccines and really saving countless lives in the process, um, and also enabling remote access for many, many workers in, in critical infrastructure. But in some ways, I think that the dramatic success that we saw in reducing time to market on the vaccine front has also shown a light on issues that continue to you know, prevent us uh, from making all manner of drugs safe, available, and affordable for all who need them across the globe. And I think pharmaceutical companies are starting to realize that more and, and address that. Crystal, does that uh, resonate with what you're seeing out there in the folks you talk to? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Keith. Uh, many of our customers uh, I, are uh, applying uh, digital technologies uh, across their organization. They're looking anywhere from kind of where they're touching the patient, patient connectivity, all the way through their business processes, uh, through uh, order uh, fulfillment. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think they all, they all believe that digitization is the enabler to provide a faster decision making and more efficient engagement across functional areas, geographical locations. And in some cases, uh, they're even talking about connecting when they're working with uh, their partner ecosystems, maybe with a CDMO for, as an example. Um, also see that, you know, there's a rapid expansion, um, capacity expansion happening in the industry. And as they're looking towards these investments and these new facilities, they're wanting to ensure that they're being born, born digital. So, mm -hmm. you know, they know that they're going to need to do things differently uh, to meet the expectations of the consumer and also their shareholders. Yeah, sometimes being born digital is easier than switching over to digital, that's for sure. Uh, Raman, what, what are you seeing in, in your travels? What are people telling you? 
No, like uh, I fully agree with Christelle here that we, we do see the same. Uh, we have, you know, conducted uh, several uh, surveys over the past uh, couple of years where we see that there is an increasing interest in, the, in utilizing or leveraging the technology that are now available uh, for their internal digitization efforts. Um, we see that you know, half of our uh, respondents are responding that the, you know, the focus on increasing operational efficiency and agility is high on the agenda, and that there's a you know definitely an awareness uh, around these things. We also see that you know like coming out of the COVID or uh, the post pandemic that the supply chains have you know become a bit more complex. You know they, they are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Say. Uh, that you know, this is all something that's high on the agenda for for these companies in terms of you know using technology to get control of these uh, uh, value chains. That makes sense. I was a bit surprised and, and sobered by the statistics that we have on, on, on this slide: sixty two percent of drug shortages ascribable to manufacturing quality issues. Of course, it's a positive thing to keep unsafe drugs off the market, but 62 seems like a pretty alarming stat, given all the advances in, in, in quality management that we've been working on for these many years. Can you maybe unpack that statistic a bit, uh, Raman? What sorts of quality problems are, are proving so persistent? Well, uh, Keith, like, you know, I, I think uh, these statistics have been there for, 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 for ages, right? Because uh, yeah. quality in, in the life sciences of pharma is a binary number, right? So it's uh, either you either it's, it's validated and, and, and proved to be released or it's not. But it's no such thing as almost there when it comes to drugs. Right. Uh, uh, so when we talk about like like compared to other industries where you can you can always uh, sell your product with lesser quality for lesser price, that doesn't happen in, in life science. Sure. <laughs> right? so that's, that's one part that needs to be understood. Uh, the second part is that Yes, uh, in order to kind of meet those uh, demands or, or those criteria to release drugs out there uh, with certain quality attributes, uh, all, they all need to be in place. Uh, so, yeah, even though the number sounds, uh, sounds high, that's how it has been. Though, what's being put on the agenda now is that there is an increasing awareness or such understanding in the industry that this is a number that something can be done about. Right? So they see that the new technologies that are emerging now uh, can definitely have an impact on that number and can bring it up. So we can actually look into uh, how you can have uh, real-time release testing with a much, much higher throughput. Um, and it, it needs to be done, right? Because like on, on the left side of the slide, you have uh, the fact that there are almost like 2 billion people on this planet uh, out of 8 billion who do not have access to the, to the simplest medicine or drugs that you and I take for granted. Uh, mm -hmm. So in order to kind of meet that challenge, you need to deal with with a uh, percentage on the right side. Yeah, no, absolutely. Anything to add from your perspective, uh, Christelle? You know, I think just uh, reemphasizing or kind of uh, reiterating what what Raman had uh, had just uh, stated. You know, there uh, we're working with a lot of our customers around you know just accelerating the pipeline and. You know, that's always been the case with life sciences. That's always been an important driver. But, you know, since COVID, uh, there's just been a uh, kind of a realization of what you can actually do. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're not always going to have the money poured into some of those initiatives to make those things happen. But, you know, enabling the technologies to, you know, accelerate pipeline and doing real-time release, uh, operator efficiency, if those are several of the things they're looking at that uh, focus in on these challenges that you've uh, mentioned here on this slide. Okay. Um, talked about digital technologies, clearly uh, an, an enabler of next generation pharma manufacturing processes. And industry has actually developed a, a couple of different maturity models, the pharma 4.0 model of the ISPE, as well as Bioforum's digital maturity index. Um, Hey, Raman, you could speak a little bit to where pharma industry is today relative to some other other industries. Where, where, where does pharma stack up um, and how is that changing with the where we were pre-pandemic? Sure, Kate, sure. Uh, also, like, first of all, these two models are, are, are good frameworks uh, to serve mm -hmm. uh, the purpose of pharma. Uh, and we all see it uh, as, as a strong partner for these companies that we are able to kind of place them in various stages, but also uh, carve out a, a roadmap or plan forward. 
So, you know, uh, pharma has traditionally, you know, been lagging, lagging uh, compared to their peers in other industries when it comes to leveraging technology. But for sure, something has definitely happened. You know, like I'll say, the needle has moved yeah. or is, is moving. Um, you know, traditionally, you see that a lot of the companies have been around, you know, if you look at the digital uh, plant maturity model around uh, stage one, two, uh, or broke out on the two side. Uh, we do have some, you know, uh, uh, unicorns that are moving towards three and four. Uh, mm -hmm. The adaptive plant or the smart factory, as we call it uh, as well, is still an aspirational target, but I think it's good to have that aspiration to get mm -hmm. things uh, going. So, uh, but again, like compared to the other industries that I've been working with, it's not to say uh, unheard of, like uh, people need to start somewhere. The good thing is that there's acknowledgement in the industry that something needs to be done. Uh, and that's where we are here uh, collectively to support that uh, journey that these uh, companies are embarking on. Yeah. And so your thoughts on what, what you see in terms of uh, the, the digital the digital maturity of, of your clients that you're speaking with from the Emerson perspective? Yeah, like uh, Rama said, they're all just on their own independent journey in different phases along their on their levels of maturity. and. There's a, you know, different characteristics. I think that you see in the different types of customers, maybe with the smaller companies, there uh, can be sometimes a bit more nimble, a little bit more uh, risk, uh, take on, willing to take on a little bit more risk. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes they're adapting a little bit more, more quickly. Um, one of the downsides is they typically don't have the larger organization and some of the expertise that might be needed in a, in a larger organization. So on you know, the flip side, when we're working with larger companies, they are a little bit more risk averse, and, but they do have a better infrastructure and a lot of expertise to help accelerate that. So really just uh, various uh, phases um, along that journey. Um, and, you know, just maybe even one example, if you think about uh, Moderna um, and Bio, um, BioNTech prior to COVID, you know, they didn't have manufacturing capacity and they made it an, an objective that there's a goal to, to start up um, digitally. And they were able to achieve that in record speed. So it's yeah. uh, just kind of interesting to see really what, um, what can be done. So yeah, I guess kind of regardless of where customers are on that journey, I would say, though, uh, um, they're, um, uh, it's no longer, when you think about technology, it's no longer a nice to have. I think everybody's starting to realize that this is something that we have to do. And so it's a little bit more of a sense of urgency, I think, that I've noticed uh, in the past mm -hmm. couple of years and a, and a willingness to really dig in and understand how technology can be an enabler. Yeah, that definitely pandemic certainly showed how digitalization could be accelerated. And, you know, some of those David and Goliath combinations like Moderna and BioNTech, that, that makes sense. The small and the large bring different resources to the party and obviously they can get the job done. So congrats on that for them. Robin, why is now the right time for digitalization? Um, is, has, what has changed? Obviously, COVID was a, a catalyzing factor. Are there other things going on? Well, I think like, you know, uh, just as was Christelle was mentioning about, you know, uh, COVID and, and uh, the pressure that this industry was put under, you know, to kind of deliver a, a remedy for, for, the, for the pandemic. You know, I think it, uh, uh, it received a scrutiny of the public, right? So they were able to kind of deliver something in, in, in a much shorter time span that has been done before. Uh, and that was only possible to be done with you know, technology that was available at the time. Uh, I would say there's no going back from this. You know, uh, there's no way that this industry can say like, well, now the pandemic is gone, let's go back to our normal uh, way of operating. But that's the new normal is technology, right? Uh, we see that there are um, organizations that are putting more and more emphasis on, on uh, and things like, you know, uh, access to medicine foundation, uh, looking at, you know, like how, uh, uh, things are actually made available for the world population. Um, mm -hmm. so there's a big, big uh, emphasis on, on, on ESG, all right, where people are talking about environmental, social, and, and governance. This yeah. industry has a social responsibility as well. 
uh, in order to meet all these demands, technology is the way, right? Uh, there is uh, no way to kind of, you know, uh, do things how they were done. So moving from paper to digital, that's the way to go. Uh, and, and that's uh, happening for sure. Right, well, that makes sense. Crystal, are there other um, tailwinds that are helping the industry to innovate digitally, other, other forces at work? Yeah, I think there's a, a couple of things. I think around uh, technology specifically, it's much more accessible uh, than it used to be. There are uh, digital tools, think of robots and sensors, they've become less expensive and they're you know, easier to access. There's also newer technologies uh, that are uh, available, such as edge computing and cloud analytics that are gaining quite a bit of uh, acceptance in the, in the industry. Uh, but I would think probably the largest thing I would say is really related to the regulatory agencies. And there has been a shift in the support and advocacy from them as it relates to uh, digitalization. Uh, there's a couple of programs uh, that have been initiated uh, by the FDA, the Advanced Manufacturing Initiative, uh, around continuous manufacturing, the um, Emerging Technologies Program. And then another example would be kind of the shift from uh, computer system validation to more of a risk-based approach um, that centers around the, test and the testing and the functionality of the, and the impacts the product quality specifically. So uh, those are, uh, I, I think, the things that I would point to as the, uh, the largest tailwinds. Hmm. A lot of positivity, a lot of um, encouragement then coming from, from, from many different sectors. But, and COVID was certainly a kick in the pants to start moving forward as well. But I think on average, the statistics would say that, that, that pharma lags behind some other more advanced industries when you think of Petrochem and some others that have been out, out front. Um, Raman, what, what hurdles uh, remain uh, from your perspective in, in getting a, a critical mass of life sciences companies to, to move forward uh, with digitalization? Sure. Sure, Keith, but I just, just as a brief comment on what just uh, Christelle sure. mentioned about you know, the FDA and the, and the regulators, like, you know, just yeah. drawing on my experience from other industries, I would say that, you know, I'm impressed by how forward-leaning uh, the regulators in the, in the life sciences have been over the past yeah. 10, 10 years, actually encouraging this industry to take on, uh, you know, the possibilities and opportunities that lies within the technology that is available, like the framework of the has been around for like like 14, 15, 16 years now. So uh, also like that's that's something that is unique to this industry by having uh, our regulators being that open-minded. You know, usually yeah. it's the other way around. Yeah, uh, I think that's the historical perspective is you know, mm -hmm. hey, this system's been validated. Don't change anything. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. uh, that's, that's, that's the historical perspective. Yeah. As long as we don't touch it, no one can blame us. Right. That's right. basically right. being the notion here. But, but going back to uh, the question of uh, you know, the hurdles, uh, I would say, you know, uh, from my perspective, uh, looking into life sciences, I would say mainly two, like if I, if I can agree it to a higher level. Uh, one is culture, as you were saying, like, you know, like, yeah, if you don't touch it, no one can blame us. Right. Uh, so there's a high level of, let's say, I would say, risk aversion. And I think uh, some of our data points show us that there are like, has, has 35 to 40% of the companies uh, report back that there's a risk aversion to digital initiatives internally, right? And that needs to be mm -hmm. dealt with uh, because this is a change. This is a big change for a lot of people. Like you know, there's, a, there's a power shift internally uh, from uh, people uh, conducting uh, their processes in a manual way to actually moving that over to, uh, to a digital uh, platform where there are other people involved, right? So you're, uh, in some cases, you're moving the lab to the factory floor. So what's being done by uh, by scientists in the labs are now conducted by operators uh, uh, on, on the on the on the production plant. Mm -hmm. So, for sure, it's 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 a cha it's a change. Uh, the pharma industry has you know historically been uh, hope to not offend anyone uh, for our listeners here, but <laughs> what, what I hear quite often is that you know pharma is the first to go second. <laughs> Now, while in other industries you have people, uh, companies jumping up saying, "Oh, let's let's just be the pioneers, like let's try things out," pharma is saying, "You know, like okay, who has done it before us? You know, prove us." You know? So, 
that that is something that is uh, inherited in, in 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 this industry. And as I said, to, in order to leverage this change management is crucial. It's a success factor. Yeah. So that's culture. Uh, second uh, hurdle is is data. You know, uh, for every digital in initiative uh, to be successful, it requires data. Uh, and it's on the principle of you know garbage in, garbage out. So like you know the quality of data is also uh, uh, quite pivotal for for what you get out. Uh, traditionally, again, you know, uh, the pharma manufacturing uh, value chain has been quite you know, uh, siloed, right? Uh, mm -hmm. they are done in, in different ways, and the data that is being produced out of those siloed are kept in those silos. So in order to kind of get full benefit out of, uh, of the digital initiatives, that data need to be, I call it, liberated, right? Made, 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 made free. Uh, and, and in order to do that, you need to have technology that is able to kind of assess and, and, and make that uh, data available uh, for consumption. And, and uh, we'll be touching upon uh, some of the technologies that are addressing that uh, later on this uh, webinar. But uh, I would say those are the two highlights I will I will mention as uh, as main hurdles. Mm -hmm. okay. Makes sense. So, um, some of the same hurdles that many other industries have, have have dealt with, and many companies in other industries are still dealing with as well. So, for sure, for sure. Are, are everywhere, not just in the not, not just in cornfields. That's for sure. <laughs> they're, they're everywhere in industry. That's for sure. Right, both Aspen Tech and Emerson, obviously, they've got a rich history of helping process industries in general and life sciences companies in, in particular, really to, to design and operate processes that are safer, more agile, and more sustainable. Um, for those in our audience that may be not so familiar with one or both of your organizations, maybe we can just take a minute to step back and kind of review the history and domain focus of your respective companies and where they deliver value for life sciences in, in particular. Maybe you want to start, Crystal. Okay, yeah, thanks, Keith. So uh, Emerson is a global leader in automation technology and software. And we help our customers in several critical industries, life sciences being one of them. And uh, the company itself was founded in 1890, which gives mm -hmm. us a rich history of providing solutions that help uh, manufacturers maximize their production and, and improve their operations. Uh, we're a global organization. Uh, we've partnered with the life science industry for many years, providing solutions uh, made up of our intelligent devices, with control systems, and uh, uh, value-added software. Common uh, from the uh, Aspen Tech side. Yeah, like you know, like um, we're, we're definitely not that old as as Microsoft <laughs> Emerson, like no, we are. Teenager in comparison, so founded back in the early 80s, we are, you know, uh, an established uh, provider of uh, of industrial software to various industries. We've been doing for for like almost four decades now. We have, you know, um, gained a lot of experience uh, addressing you know, uh, cross industry challenges uh, throughout the digitization. You mentioned earlier today that you know, like, yeah, what. Um, pharma is ongoing now is not something unique because of other industries who did the same uh, some years ago. Uh, so that's where we are actually, you know, uh, that's our, our, our pedigree, that's where we're coming from. We focus on process mm -hmm. efficiencies and, and asset optimization, which is equally relevant for life sciences. And, and the theme of, uh, of, of Aspen Tech is that we are addressing, you know, the, the dual challenge, as we call it. Like, and in this context, it's basically Making sure that we are able to meet, you know, the increasing demand of the growing population in a, in a sustainable and 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 a profitable way for our customers. So that's where we put our our emphasis. So, yeah. So that's mm -hmm. that's in short. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, for those in the audience not uh, familiar with the most recent developments within a, about the last year or so, uh, Emerson and Aspen Tech entered into an expanded partnership that really gave Emerson controlling interest in Aspen Tech. And really, um, you guys can obviously move forward and in, in, in really exploiting and taking advantage of, of those synergies. Crystal, can you speak to that transaction and, and its implications for, uh, for, for for pharma companies? Yeah, uh, as you uh, mentioned, Keith, it was a little over a year ago now, I guess, where we had acquired a major stake in uh, Aspen Tech. 
And the new partnership has allowed for the combination of a global industrial automation leader to come mm-hmm. together with uh, the industrial software leader, uh, Aspen Tech. And the goal there was to build a high growth, diverse portfolio where together we are uh, able to be more strategic in the way that we deliver solutions uh, that really that leverage each other's strengths in what uh, we bring to the um, uh, to the portfolio combined portfolio. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, this next slide shows a little bit of the the actual scope when you look at the combined <laughs> combined capabilities. Uh, having been exposed to some uh, Aspen Tech's steady state design tools back in the back in the 80s, as well as Fisher Provox DCS systems. And I've written about both companies for many years. Uh, I can certainly see the important synergies between where each, uh, each, each of your organizations can bring to the table for life sciences. Uh, but for the benefit of our listeners today, can you maybe speak to where you, where you see those synergies from your perspective? Maybe, Crystal, if you want to continue. Yeah, sure. Uh, so if you look at the, the, the slide there, you can see um, quite a few uh, areas where we uh, it represents our, our complete portfolio. And it brings a comprehensive set of solutions uh, that addresses uh, challenges with our customers across their entire product um, uh, life cycle from the early on in process design development and through on to distribution. And uh, together we're able to deliver solutions that connect the plant floor to the to the boardroom. Uh, just kind of maybe pointing out a brief example. Uh, Aspen Tech is, you know, really known for their, you know, simulation. And you mentioned that uh, a bit, uh, just a moment ago. And it's really geared toward early on in the process design and really helping to get that lined out ahead of time in the, in the early phases. And Emerson likewise has a simulation system, but its uh, fit is much different than where Aspen Tech is. It's really more geared towards the test automation testing and uh, operator training. Uh, and so together that gives a complete t- solution uh, for the needs for a simulation. But that's just one example. There, there are several others, but for purposes of time on this call, I, that, I just point out that example. Yeah, yeah. I think the promise there of what I, I've taken to calling integration in the fourth dimension, meaning not just system integration, but integration across time, is, it's pretty important over the life cycle of these systems. So I think that's one of the biggest uh, potential things that excites me. What about from your perspective, Ron? You know, I'll say, um, Keith, that in like uh, going back to the... Uh, the digital maturity model that we discussed earlier on this call, you know, we had this uh, notion of, you know, the, the smart enterprise or smart uh, factory. Uh, I would say that this slide here represents, you know, a definition of smart manufacturing, which is basically a combination of automation, computing, and data analytics. And for me, that's basically Emerson and Aspen together, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, if these two companies together, is actually creating a, a, a possibility for our customers to kind of put in place, you know, an ecosystem of solutions that leverages the data that is uh, being generated in this uh, uh, manufacturing value chain and, and actually leverage the benefits across. Uh, we, we know that uh, uh, Emerson has a strong foothold in this industry through their Delta V install base. Uh, and we would believe that, you know, like by, by enabling Delta V with Aspenix solutions, the customers are able to kind of leverage uh, some real significant benefits that are, you know, driving this industry towards the maturity level they want to achieve within their digitalization initiatives. So I'm, I'm, I'm a strong believer, and I know this slide it looks a bit crowded, but there's a lot of uh, mm-hmm. insight and intel in this slide. Yeah. I think maybe the, the, the next one, next slide is actually a little more interesting in that it uh, kind of shows you know, the path forward of, of what this kind of integration and these synergies can, can enable uh, moving forward. Um, what, what excites you about this slide, Crystal? Uh, what, what, uh, what do you think is interesting here? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I think 
prior to just even addressing this, the, the slide specifically, what I'm you know really most excited about with the Aspen Tech, or what excites me personally, yeah. is uh, the people. And I've had the opportunity to work with uh, my colleagues over at Aspen Tech prior to uh, the close of the acquisition, just getting to know each other and understand each other's portfolios. And I'm continually impressed by the expertise that they bring and the knowledge and the understanding that they do have. Uh, in the industry. And so bringing that together and, and addressing this slide uh, kind of knowing where our, as we're working with our customers on where they're at on their digital journey, we are now able to provide a more comprehensive set of solutions to help them on the journey. And, you know, if we were singularly on our own, we just didn't have access to the amount of uh, uh, solutions that we can pull together, either individually or, or integrated together. So it's a, just an exciting time as we're engaging with our customers to put these pieces together and help them uh, along that journey. Yeah. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll just echo that sentiment uh, of Chriselle, like saying, you know, like having our teams working together, it has been, you know, Amazing, uh, you know. We we all know that diversity matters, uh, mm -hmm. and bringing in the teams from from both sides, which have different, uh, mm -hmm. you know, approaching this industry from various angles, uh, is definitely a strength that we uh, we bring to the, to the table to our customers. So, and we are already, you know, um, receiving confirmation from our mutual customers where they see that you know, like the team, the tag team of Aspen and Emerson, is 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 a strong partner for these mm -hmm. customers having already some engagements ongoing uh, with our customers where we are teaming up. So I think, you know, uh, going back to the slide itself, you know, I think, you know, uh, this, this digitization journey will, uh, you know, end up by with providing more visibility to, to the customers and by having mm -hmm. the data made available, uh, scalability. And in the end, it's all about need for speed. You know, yeah. it's increasing the speed, it's increasing the throughput. Uh, uh, increasing you know, the uh, the quality levels that are, are required to kind of deliver on, on time and at scale. Yeah. Are there any particular use cases or, or problems or opportunities, I guess, that you've been able to, to address um, together that maybe you weren't able to tackle uh, individually? Have you identified any of those yet? There's... I'm, I'll, just chime out. <laughs> I'll chime out and just jump in there. You know, yeah. I think one of the areas where I am most excited about, and we're going to kind of maybe talk about this in a few minutes, is the Inmation uh, acquisition and, and uh, the things that that product uh, can bring together as it kind of is the glue of kind of where our pieces come together to, to share information. So yeah. we're working with several customers, quite honestly, in uh, – in that architecture, and uh, it's it's quite an enabling uh, technology. So there there are several yeah. others, but that's uh, the one that is you know the most comprehensive uh, for yeah. the majority of our customers. Yeah. So you yeah. you had and to so buy so it just to get just to get innovation, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Well, we could also, and Crystal mentioned the fact that uh, you know the Delta V version 15 has you know the the mm. PAT. Uh, block uh, enabled now, so that's definitely some. Uh, some it's a short and uh, quick win, yeah. where we are bringing PAT, uh, you know, uh, right. more file accessible for the yes. uh, for the entire install install base of uh, Delta V. So yeah. uh, there are many, many more to come. Like, no, it will be boring the audience by by listing everything up here. <laughs> <laughs> this, yeah. this is really exciting. Yeah. We've got just a couple more slides to cover, but I wanted to remind our, 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 our listeners here to uh, uh, go ahead. If you've got some questions, go ahead and get those entered into the Ask a Question box. Just a couple more things to cover, and then we'll, 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 we'll tackle as many of those as we can get to here. Um, I think that last, uh, those, some of those last comments are, are a good uh, transition into this next slide, really talking about, I mean, the two companies already seem to be on parallel paths, both Aspen Tech and Emerson, before this this acquisition came together, um, Emerson um, on the with Flexa and 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 Inmation on the Aspen Tech side. Maybe you can take a few minutes to really talk about um, 
what new capabilities these recent acquisitions bring to the combined uh, combined unit. Um, so uh, I'll start with Flux. I guess that's uh, that's on the Emerson side, Crystal. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's just an a, a acquisition we're very excited about. Uh, for many years, Emerson has been a leader in the industry as it relates to recipe management within the manufacturing mm -hmm. space. And yeah. we are differentiated in the market with the tight integration between our MES platform and our uh, DCS. And this past year, we, with the acquisition of Flexa, their product, uh, PKM, uh, it allows us to digitize the recipe management across the entire life cycle uh, of, the, of a product. So starting from research all the way through product development and then on down into, uh, into manufacturing. And uh, we've uh, partnered with uh, several leading life science companies to develop mm -hmm. a standard way of integration to bring these pieces together um, across our, our various platforms. So uh, together it, you know, greatly reduces uh, the time to bring new products to market. And uh, we have several customers that are taking advantage of that today. So we're uh, just very excited about the evolution of the, of the recipe management that we can uh, bring. Sounds great. And Raman, you want to speak to um, Inmation a bit? Yeah, um, and animation is is also quite interesting acquisition made by us. And I was I was personally involved in that acquisition, and, yeah. and it's a very interesting company, right? It, it has a strong value proposition that's been validated by by some major big brands already. And I'll say, you know, the core of this company or the or the solution is actually, you know, addressing the challenges that we were discussing today. You know, in terms of the siloed data, you know, I'll say this this solution brings order. Finally, it brings order to the uh, IT OT data challenge that we've been experiencing in life sciences, right? And also the silo data that uh, occurs in that uh, interface. Uh, we see uh, that you know the customers that are are, are already using the software uh, or solution is is experiencing much much better and higher degree of you know informed decision making, uh, mm -hmm. because the data is being made available you know in real time. Uh, in the right uh, context, you know, and that's you know, internally we have uh, the four C's that we call them, like, you know, the kind of, it's not all just by identifying the data, but it's also to collect the data, you know, mm -hmm. is to create data, data to make sure that, you know, things are cleaned up and has the right quality. Uh, and then, you know, to also contextualize it into the right um, um, setting where it's going to be used. And then lastly, to make sure that it's consumed. So, uh, personally, I think innovation is a, is a is a really really appealing uh, tech, you know. And and there are uh, always always there are, there are you know a lot of initiatives uh, going on in this area right now in, within the life sciences and pharma companies. But um, we see that you know the customers that have are taking innovation use are, are are doing quite good. So more to come, more to come, and I'm uh, happy to kind of tell more. This is like. Just I remember, top I remember going to, I think the Emerson Exchange just a couple years ago where data contextualization was a, was a huge theme of that uh, story. And yeah. They had to explain exactly what they were talking about for a while, but, but I think it, it definitely resonates with what, what Innovation's uh, secret sauce is and, and bringing that to the party. So I think that's great to hear. Um, talking a little bit about what's coming up uh, in the near future here. Um, happen to be, uh, if back is next week, um, really coming up very soon, the International Forum for Process Analytical Chestry, which is really, I think, is resolved into a leading, leading conference, uh, exploring the movement of laboratory-based analysis into the real-time closed-loop realm of, of process control. So very much where both Aspen Tech and, and Emerson live. I understand you'll both be there together at the conference uh, next week. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you have planned for next week and what people might expect to see if they can uh, sneak off to, uh, to, to Bethesda in their schedule? Yep, hey, very excited about uh, about next week. And uh, like you mentioned, we both uh, Aspen Tech and Emerson are gonna be there. We're gonna be there together. In the exhibit hall, we've got a total of five presentations. Uh, two of those are going to be co-presented by with Emerson and, and Aspen Tech. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and we're also going to be co-hosting a networking event uh, by mm -hmm. invitation only. So hope okay. to see many of you there. Yeah. And I, I just add that if, if you want more information on, on IFPAC, there's a, uh, a link in the webinar resources uh, to save some time to the event there. Raman, any perspective, uh, maybe long no, term, uh, what, what you can share with us, I guess? I mean, I just just building on what uh, what Priscilla said, like, you no, know, like, uh, we are really ha happy about this partnership, right? Like, and uh, we'll be seeing a lot of me and Christelle together going forward in our team. So we are proud of this partnership. There's no hide and seek anymore. So, so this is like <laughs> all up in the air. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and our teams, as Crystal was mentioning, that are, are, are working continuously now to draw upon you know, the best of best uh, for our customers to kind of you know, uh, leveraging you know, the, both the existing install base, but also new innovative uh, solutions uh, coming up, you know, uh, where mm -hmm. we see how we can combine our tech together for the benefit of our customers. And we already mentioned you know, Delta V uh, version 15, but uh, it's more to come, more to come. That's the only thing I can say. Yeah. <laughs> Crystal, are there things that you can talk about uh, that you can share from your perspective? Well, we're, uh, you know, can't talk too much about our, our roadmap, but we are definitely working together in planning uh, future uh, investments together, uh, as well as acquisitions. And we are kind of looking at those together and, and how we can find synergies between uh, the organization Uh you know, together, we're also going to both continue to be actively engaged in, uh, in a, you know, ISPE and with the BioForum and con continuing kind of leading or in, the, in those conversations uh, in, within those organizations. Uh, another thing I did want to point out I'm very excited about is that we just made a decision a couple of weeks ago, we're going to be making an investment here in our Austin facility to put together a life science specific demo center. And it'll be a place where uh, our customers can come and see all of our products and solutions, software working together um, for our life science customers. And when I say together, that's Aspen Tech and, and Emerson. It'll be a complete uh, uh, digital experience that we can uh, immerse our, our customers in. And just very excited about that. We're, expected to be finished with that. We're targeting uh, uh, October, October, November timeframe. So certainly by the end of this year, we'll be able to have customers uh, in uh, hosting customers in that facility. So very excited about that. Sounds great. Congratulations on that and, and, and have a great event at, uh, at IFPAC next week. I think, we're, um, I think that wraps up the formal part of our, of our engagement here. Um, unless, did you have something to add, Raman? No, I'm fine. I'm fine. I just thought I heard a heard a noise there, but uh, I think that was just uh, some feedback. Um, so, if you haven't asked uh, entered your question in the question box already, please um, please enter those. And um, we see we've already got a fair number coming in. So let's we'll switch over to that for you, and we'll start uh, answer, asking uh, answering the questions that you have. Um, this first one uh, for you, Raman, uh, I think you alluded to this a little bit, but maybe you want to elaborate. The question is, uh, will Aspen Tech be embedding software solutions in Emerson's Delta V system? Might it come in before you, you mentioned some of those uh, innovations, but uh, can you maybe talk a little bit about what you're doing and working on? Well, um, what, what I can share is that, you know, like uh, there's no uh, doubt that, you know, Delta V does constitute a, a, a backbone. Uh, for our joint offering in in the life sciences, right? So, like, you know, given the large footprint of that uh, system out there, uh, it will be you know you can see how we can build uh, an ecosystem of data sharing around Delta V. Um, the first thing out is our our PAD or uh, models with our unscrambler models that are being made available uh, throughout Delta V, and there are uh, other uh, solutions that we're looking to as well. So this will be, you know, communicated, you know, uh, widely uh, as we progress. But uh, I do ensure uh, that mm -hmm. you know there's a lot in the making. Yeah. It's another um, another kind of follow-up question, a little bit related to that. Um, uh, will Inmation 
remain vendor agnostic now that Aspen Tech has acquired it. And I would also argue, will Aspen Tech continue to have relationships with other other um, other platform suppliers um, now that you're part of the Emerson organization? So the key that was for me or Christelle? Um, Either one of you, although you're, you're, it was in Mation particularly, so we can start with yeah, Mation and we can talk about that. Yeah. I, I, I can start, like, you know, like, um, obviously, like, you know, Mation is, is, is uh, quite, uh, you know, the phrase this way, like, you know, the value of Mation comes out of being data agnostic, right? So, like, it, it should be processing data regardless of what system the data is generated or consumed from. Uh, mm -hmm. So, limiting us to only Aspen or Emerson systems will be, you know, a counterproductive for our customers. Right. So like my, 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 my simple answer here is like we consume or we, we, we make it agnostic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and to the second part of the question, whether we will be limiting ourselves only to the Aspen Emerson, no, we, we obviously have a customer centric approach here, right? So we will work with what we have and uh, our all those solutions are, are adaptable to the existing infrastructure for our customers and then work from there so um i would say no uh, we are not limiting ourselves only to our solutions we do talk and we acknowledge that there are other vendors out there as well anything to add from your perspective and just to reiterate what uh, raman said i the animation is definitely has to be vendor uh, agnostic as a you know data repository it's you know as much as i would like everything to be delta v it's not <laughs> all delta v right so uh, there's a lot of systems out there and, and different other all kinds of data sources it's not even limited to control systems it's just endless of the amount of data and that's the beauty of the animation it, it brings all that data together in context and makes it available for further data analytics. So yeah, definitely uh, the plan would be to keep that vendor agnostic, so. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, here's an interesting question um, we've got coming in. What percentage of, of I guess, uh, the pharma of, I guess, pharma measurements that used to be in the lab, what, what percentage do you think could be done using PAT feedback control. So what percent, I think the to interpreting the question is what percentage of measurements could be done, uh, analytical measurements could be implemented in close to loop fashion versus stuff that would remain in, in, a, in a laboratory. That's my interpretation of the question anyway. Uh, what do you, I'm, you gonna have a throw, I'm gonna need to throw that to Raman as the <laughs> expert in PAT. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it's kind of like, let's say, open question, right? Like, you know, what percentage, uh, you know, if you ask me, uh, yeah. to believe of PAT, a lot. You know, that's a, a high number. <laughs> that's you know, a good number. number. Uh, uh, so it all depends on how far you want to kind of take it, right? Yeah. Uh, PAT is, uh, you know, PAT is a wide set of technologies. It's not just one system or one right. solution. It's more yeah. of an approach. It's a way of thinking, right? So when... And, and and feedback control, like it, it uh, like we've been discussing closed loop control for for a while, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, I believe you know, like there there's a there's a lot to be done from yeah. where we are today before we reach the ultimate state of having closed loop with base yeah. and PAT. Yeah. So uh, if if I can allow myself to be answering this <laughs> on, on a generic way, uh, yeah. there's a lot that to be done. Uh, it's all yeah. about you know our mission level and and also measuring you know the. Uh, um, the input versus output, like what are we getting out of this? As we yeah. discussed today, there's a lot yeah. to be done in pharma uh, that is um, that requires less than the full process control, uh, control loop control. Yeah. I'm sure but it better think, that uh, addresses the question correctly, yeah, but. Uh, I think so, but I, I think the, there's a lot that can be done now. I mean, I think just from my perspective, just the analytical techniques, the, the process analysis, things that have come out of the lab and are at line or, or online has really blossomed over the years and there's a lot to be learned from 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 other um, industries even if you look in the chemical or refining industry that, that has brought a lot of very sophisticated lab techniques online uh, that's, that, that I think is a, is a way to uh, definitely definitely a lot of potential there uh, all right let's move on still got a few minutes left all right let's see 
Here's another kind of uh, one for <laughs> one for you to speculate on. What do Aspen Tech and Emerson consider to be the, the top three, we need three, uh, most promising digitalization initiatives for pharma? What do, where do you get the most bang for the buck in terms of digitalization for pharma? What, what are those particular areas <laughs> of use cases uh, for digital? And I assume that you're looking at me now, Keith, are you? Or <laughs> <laughs> whoever wants to tackle that one. I don't know, Crystal, you can. Okay. You uh, uh, I, 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 I'll take go with this, Crystal, and you can correct okay. me if I'm wrong. But uh, I'll, say that again. I'll probably sound like a broken record, but uh, PAT for sure. Yeah. Right? Because uh, PAT, again, is, uh, is an is a, is a approach rather than just a technology or, or, or a product, uh, mm -hmm. data intensive. You know, so having uh, the combination of what we have between Emerson and Aspen Tech now, we have data available uh, both through Delta V and also in Nation. So that's uh, definitely something to kind of put yield uh, results in process control and quality control for products. Mm -hmm. uh, the second time, thing I would highlight is our abilities within uh, predictive and prescriptive maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a lot that could be done there, uh, you know, to kind of, you know, uh, reduce unplanned downtime, uh, reduced uh, uh, cost of uh, preventive maintenance. You know, we, we know that uh, the pharmaceutical industry is spending a lot of money uh, on, on preventive maintenance, right? So they, they do things to just ensure that uh, the downtime doesn't occur. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, and lastly, I will probably highlight um, uh, going back to my initial, you know, one of the first comments I made about this uh, complexity in the supply chain that, you know, uh, scheduling, uh, planning and scheduling uh, is uh, also an important area where, you know, the, uh, the, the wide network of suppliers need to be, you know, planned currently to make sure that we are able to kind of deliver on time as as, as expected or as, uh, as wished for. So, yeah, PAT predictive uh, prescriptive maintenance and and planning and scheduling. Those will be my three. Um, Christelle, what's your take? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would certainly agree with those three uh, for sure. I might also want to add on there uh, the uh, things around a tech transfer and just being able to introduce more products into manufacturing that this is becoming more and more um challenging as the products are many, but they are small. And so there's much higher demand for bringing in more products from product development into manufacturing and having a way to, you know, more quickly, efficiently do that, um, that transfer of information. So I think that that would maybe just be one that I would add to the ones that you said, Rama, but certainly PAT and predictive maintenance. So and that's uh, that, that's a good one right? because we, we all know that you know tech transfer is an important part, right? Uh, and and having that done in the most efficient mm -hmm. way, with all the data again <laughs> required yeah. to do that in a uh, in a best possible way, uh, tech transfer is is definitely uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, part of the digital transformation that's taking place right now. Yeah, and maybe just one other thing to point out. I think that's exciting back to this relationship where. Historically, Emerson's sweet spot really hasn't necessarily been in product development per se, mm -hmm. and uh, in that early engagement and with our uh, PKM product, it's getting us there. But when combined that with the uh, the uh, the modeling that we get from the Aspen Tech, that also kind of is in touching in that area, which is a place where Emerson typically hasn't. Uh, been a player and so it allows us to extend our reach into just a larger a broader uh span within it within an organization and putting our solutions together so makes a lot of sense uh, i think we got time for one or two more here um what are the top reasons that life science customers hesitate or delay making progress on the maturity model or pharma 4.0 journey maybe you want to Maybe you want to tackle that, Crystal. Yeah, I think just maybe reiterating, reiterating on some of the things we talked about earlier, I think we've always just done things a certain way. And with all of the challenges with revalidating, 
it makes it difficult to adopt new technologies. I think there's a willingness and a want to, but the cost and the barriers have historically been sometimes difficult. I didn't, and I think culture is another, and you know, organizational change. You know, people have to do things different, and that can sometimes be a large effort to change the way people go about their 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 day to day. So I think those would be, I, I think, the two or a couple of challenges there. I see. Okay. We're coming up towards the, the, the end of our hour here. Um, you know, if you've got any last questions, please jump in. Uh, I'm gonna pick from a few here. Um, how, how will Emerson and Aspen Tech address customer, uh, customers that have both Aspen Tech and Emerson solutions, say at different sites uh, for a particular application area? How, how will you handle those kind of mixed uh, mixed modality um, clients. Yeah, do you want me to take that, Brahman? <laughs> sure, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, you know, each of our customers are going to have different needs, and really the key is that we will be working together and trying to understand what the business drivers are and what the uh, needs are, and we would just kind of partner together and work with the customer in partnership to find the best solution uh, mm -hmm. together. And uh, we're working as one organization and you know, it, it doesn't really matter to us, one product or the other, it really is what is best, the best fit for, for the customers. And we'll just be working together with them to, to sort through that in partnership. I agree. I agree. It, it's uh, we have done this, you know, with uh, the customer in focus here. So um, uh, having, you know, like an, any, uh, oh, I agree. Customer first. <laughs> there you go. I think we got time for one more. It's kind of a kind of a softball question, I guess. A little bit. Uh, will Emerson and Aspen Tech consider other strategic acquisitions going forward? If you want to tackle yeah. that, uh... we're, we're continually looking at we're <laughs> continually looking at uh, it, common investments and uh, acquisitions yeah. together. And the kind of the beauty of this is that we do get to collaborate on and share information about what that is, so that we're not both investing, uh, you know, separately, and we can leverage. Uh, leverage what each other is doing. So that's that's one of the, the values and the benefits of this partnership, quite frankly. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm uh, just adding to that, Keith, you know, like, you know, uh, uh, we are both two quite innovative uh, companies. We do co-innovation both uh, with our customers. We have historically done that uh, in, a, in a good way. Uh, and there's all a constant, you know, uh, assessment to build or buy. So, like, you know, if we are able to build something, uh, we do that. Uh, we find that there's an uh, opportunity of acquiring uh, a company that has something that will, you know, yield a better result in, in a short time. We'll do that. So, uh, the, the more important part here is that we do take, you know, the, the customer perspective, seeing how can we uh, bring, and going back to the maturity model, how do we help the yeah. customers go along that, uh, that journey? Uh, in the best possible way with what we have today and what we can have tomorrow. Well, that's, that's a good point to point to end on here, I think. Um, we've run to the end of our hour. I don't, don't want to uh, uh, keep people beyond that time. For those of you who, whose questions we didn't have time to answer, uh, we'll be getting back to you via email, so, so look for that. Um, but that concludes today's presentation. Um, on behalf of Pharma Manufacturing, thank you, Christelle and, and Rama, for joining me today. Emerson and Aspen Tech, of course, for sponsoring today's webinar, and of course, all of you for, for joining us. Um, one last thing, as you as we end our end our uh, live session, there will be an exit survey that pops up, and please please take the time to, to answer a few short questions there. Helps us really to craft um, webinars that uh, better meet your your needs going forward. So, thanks again. Uh, Raman and Crystal, and everybody have a great day. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye now.